station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston Station, yes. Uh, the International Space Station is ready for the event. Society Radio Canada, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Hello, Chris. Uh, bonjour, Chris. It's uh, Alex from uh, Montreal SRC. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, Montreal SRC, I hear you loud and clear. How me? I can hear you very well. I transfer you, je te transfère. Donc, euh, on va commencer à parler en français. So that we're going to start speaking in French from now on. I'm handing you over. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Good evening, Mr. Hatfield. Bonsoir, comment ça va? Good evening, how are you? Yes. Doing very well. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. We're going to start in a few minutes. Good evening, Mr. Hatfield. Bonsoir, bonsoir. Good evening, good evening, how are you? We're very well. We're very lucky to get to speak to you. We're very privileged. You were nine years old when Neil Armstrong appeared as a person that you wanted to follow his traces, and that was a very determining moment for you. Now that you are on the third mission as the commander, right now, can you say that you have reached the end of your dreams? Moi, je suis un, un, uh, mm. un gars I am uh, just a chance, very lucky uh, Canadian guy. <laughs> of course, uh, I have uh, reached my dreams 20 years ago already. It's more than a dream. It's not just a visit to the space station, just to build a part of it, to visit it. But now I am lucky, very hard to believe, but that I am able to live here, to be a spaceman. For me, this is incredible. This is reality, but at the same time, it's very hard to believe. Hard to believe, but the load of responsibilities you have as a commander, what does this represent, these, these responsibilities? Are you ready for everything, even to make a decision that might be an extreme decision that you might have to make? Well, this is the life of a commander of the ISS. Usually, it's a very calm life here. We are in a lab, an American lab. We call it Destiny. Over there, we have the European, the Japanese lab. We also have the Russian lab. So usually, it's quite calm and just life in the lab. But as a commander, I'm in charge of a lot of things, health, and well-being for the crew, make sure that they're well taken care of, and also the, make sure that the space station is in good health, so to speak, and also the experiments. And I have to be ready for this all the time, every day. And this is our everyday life. But if we do have a problem, perhaps uh, we have a lack of pressure, of uh, there could be a fire somewhere, we have to always be ready day and night. It is my responsibility to make the right decisions in a case like this. So obviously it's a very high level of responsibility, a lot more than the last flight that I did 17 years ago. And of course you were mentioning your last flight 17 years ago and now you share with us several years, several times a day you are telling us how it, oh, it takes 90 minutes to go around the world. We do this with you every day. And as a scientist, what is the status of the health of our planet Earth? Uh, 
For me, maybe uh, this is something between reality and a miracle, to be able to look at life and look at Earth like this. It gives us different perspectives, and I try to show this, to share this with everybody, with the pictures, and also with words I try to express that. And Earth obviously has been there for ages and there is a certain permanence of it when you look at it you can see the changes in the last 20 years the changes that were human induced natural changes all of that but what I think is the perspective as a result of that is to be able to be responsible to be a member of the crew, not only on the space station, but of our planet Earth, which is our spatial vessel, vehicle. And of course, there are changes, but it's not the end. It's not the end of life, it's just reality. And we need to take the proper small steps individually, personally, so that we can improve this. And this is my perspective with all the astronauts and maybe this is the astronauts perspective that will always remain on earth do you think that there could be another chris hadfield uh, because after you speak to the children all the time there's more than six 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 hundred thousand people on twitter we talk to all the children all the time Will there be another Chris Hadfield in the future? Maybe he won't be as good as you, but do you think that's possible? I know very well that I am not unique, but yes, we need to remember that when I made the decision to become an astronaut, it wasn't difficult. It was impossible. We did not have a Canadian space station. We didn't have any astronauts, we didn't have a Canadian space agency. When I made that decision, that's how it was. And now it became a reality. So the students throughout Canada, I spoke to the ones in Le Leval and through Radio Amateur earlier today. For them, it is absolutely a possibility. It's not uh, guaranteed. It is difficult, but for me, it was impossible, and now it's reality. So I am certain that there will be other future astronauts that will be training, not just in David Sanjak and Mr. Hudson, but all the other younger students even. And the rest of the universe is waiting, and it's just up to us to make the proper efforts and to describe and to establish our own destiny. Thank you, Chris Hadfield, and uh, good returns to Earth in May. Thank you. Thank you. I still have two months to go, but I am ready to come back to Earth as well. But every day is a very very dear to me, and I love life here, but I also would love to go back home. Thank you, Mr. Hadfield. Good morning, Mr. Hadfield. This is Charles Tisser from Bonjour, Charles. Comment ça va? Interview Radio Canada. How are you? It's, I'm doing fine. Thank you, Mr. Hadfield. Now you are the commander of the International Space Station. What does that mean as far as the responsibilities with regard to the science experiments conducted on board? There's many experiments on the station, more than 100 experiments. We're conducting the small ones to measure exactly the quality of uh, gravity and then some alpha magnetic spectrometer experiments to learn more about the small particles of the universe. So I am in charge of the experiments, the health of the station, for the experiments, but every day there's a couple of hours we spend 
on doing experiments with our own hands with the experience that there is on this station. We work all together to use this lab, this unique environment in this lab that is with weightlessness to better understand the universe, to better understand human health and to use this for the objective of the lab. And I'm just one more of the crew when we do that. Why is it that an astronaut is uh, weightless in orbit in the space station? That is a good question. If you jump when you're on Earth, you fall back on the Earth right away because of gravity. But if you have a huge speed, you would fall due to gravity at the same time as the curvature of Earth. So if you have a speed that is fast enough, you can fall exactly at the same time as the curve of the Earth. So you're constantly falling, so to speak non-stop. It's not that there isn't any gravity here, it's just that it's due to the orbit of the station, you have to have gravity in order to stay in orbit. But here we are in weightlessness due to the orbit and the speed of the station. So I'm falling, everything is falling here, the station is falling together, and in this environment of weightlessness, it's very funny to be here, actually. It's different, and this provides us an opportunity to conduct experiments that would be impossible to conduct on Earth. And so let's talk about the experience on which you are working on with the BP regulator. And what are the effects on the human body? Yes, there is a part of the problem of the Canadian population that has a problem with uh, fainting with a low blood pressure within their body. So there is an experiment here right now to better understand, because for now, there's no gravity. So blood doesn't go down through the bottom of my legs. And so these experiments, our body is adapted to do that. And with this type of adaptation, we can better understand how the body controls this. So with this, type of equipment, we have these cuffs that we put on our legs and we can keep the blood on the leg and, and take it off quickly and with that blood will go back down to the legs and then that lowers the blood pressure and then in a few minutes we could know exactly how the heart works and how the system that regulates this and I can repeat this experiment several times in weightlessness I have done it several times on earth so the researchers the doctors that are researching this know how this body works in gravity on Earth, and here we can see exactly the changes that come about. And on the exterior of my body, you can see this, better learn, it's possible maybe to see how the system works. And so this is an experiment that's Waterloo. It's uh, from Waterloo, and this is very interesting for me. I'm very interested in this type of response. Is there a risk to faint for the astronauts when they come back to Earth, and will this help us better understand so that we don't have a sudden loss of blood pressure when you return on Earth? Yes, this is one. It's for astronaut health when we come back to Earth, yes, definitely. Because the first few minutes after six minutes in weightlessness, six months in weightlessness, it is very important for the system the way that it regulates us. And to avoid this, it's a lot better for us to learn how this works. But it's not just for us. It's also to better learn 
for the entire country, for the entire country of Canada, for the population that has problems with fainting, it's for them as well that we're doing these experiments. Commander Hatfield, when you do a long-term mission, whether it's on the International Space Station or in the future towards Mars, for example, uh, will astronauts need to have an artificial gravity spaceship to make sure their physical capacities will be good? It, and you have microflow also there. Can you talk about that? Yes, this is an experiment that is very interesting. I can show you actually. So normally you need to go to the hospital to use the equipment to perhaps analyze a blood test. But with a challenge such as a voyage in space, there is a group of inventors and engineers and doctors in Quebec who created microflow. And in the small box, which weighs approximately 10 kilograms, as big as a uh, small little uh, oven. With this, you can analyze after just 10 minutes, you can analyze blood. And so these capabilities are new for us. With a such a small device as this, we don't need to bring our blood down to Earth in the freezer and then to Earth. And as you said, Charles, for a very long voyage, like it would be even farther away from Earth, then that would be impossible. So here we have a, a portable uh, a device that can analyze this and after 10 minutes we can know the results of the blood test and better understand the health of the astronauts. It's very, very interesting. I conducted the first experiments with this last week and with this in the future we would be able to have a little hospital in a box in the station for us in the future. And with something this small it's possible for Canadians who who live far from a hospital, in the north or in the south, far away, maybe even just in a small clinic, this is a lot cheaper to run blood tests this way. So it's a very interesting and important invention that has been used for the first time here in the International Space Station. Commander, how do you do to protect the astronauts on the space station with respect to radiation in the one minute, if you can tell me, please. Yes, normally on Earth, we have the atmosphere, which is protecting Earth between the cosmic rays and the rays from the sun. So it is good to be able to measure that. And so there is an experiment that is also a Canadian experiment with our flag, which uses liquid. I'll show you. liquid And with this, use this liquid and so during a week you can see the changes in this test tube in one week and every small particle of energy of the universe of radiation if we have neutrons here and this is the most dangerous here for human health it creates a small bubble in this liquid and it stays there and we have a system with a computer that it, we can count how many bubbles are created in a week and with this we could better learn to see how many and what kind of radiation arrives to the station and so with this we are able to have a well-designed system to protect the astronauts against this. So, firstly, it's very necessary to know 
and to learn the environment. This is not the only experiment that we are conducting to learn this, but this is a Canadian experiment that I am in charge of on a regular basis, and also I can't wait to get the results to better understand the environment in space and our, for our future in space between Earth and the other planets. Thank you very much, Mr. Ha Commander Hatfield, and have a good mission. Thank, thank you for your time and your interest. Thank you. Thank you. The station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. Thank you very much. Merci. And thank you, Society Radio Canada. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.